I was in Auschwitz. I built Auschwitz because I arrived there in the first transport. For almost 50 years, I did not speak about it. But nevertheless, throughout that whole time, Auschwitz was present in everything I did. I do not know if I would have ever gone back to Auschwitz if it hadn't been for my stroke. My drawings stem from my illness. During my rehabilitation, I asked to be given a pencil and I started to draw. Drawing became a battle for life. I wanted to get away from the illness. There was no great plan, just an attempt to save myself. Afterwards, a sense of duty came into play. There was a chance to do what I promised my friends in the camp. My friends who died and who, like Stefan Jarac, imposed on me the duty of telling people what had gone on there. In the beginning, there were only a few drawings. But then they started to increase in number, more and more. I don't know why. Maybe the increase drew strength from that mixture of feelings I had, my fighting for my own life, and that sense of duty awakened after all those years. Of my own free will, I shut myself up in the camp once more. This is not an exhibit, nor art, nor images, but words contained in designs. It is a rendering of honor to all those who have vanished in ashes. After this I looked and behold, a great multitude which no man could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9. On the parade ground, there was a bell. This bell summoned us every day to muster, but it rang too for the execution of inmates, which we were forced to witness. You never knew if it was only the notification for the daily count, or if it was the announcement of a death. I see in it a summons to the lost judgment. It was Krankenman who rang the bell. There was the name of the man who, for me, was the worst of all the Germans in the camp. A couple. His name was an omen. In German, Krankenmann means sick man. Krankenmann held great power over us inmates. He was notorious for his sadistic torturing and murdering. On his walking stick, he carved a notch for each person he murdered. I draw only hell. Heaven is not present. The matter is one only between human beings. And do we go down, already condemned by the finger of providence, 
into our own abyss? I was in a situation once, so close to becoming a zombie, that I was afraid that I might drop my bowl and lose my food. My friends helped me hold on to the bowl, so I knew, and everyone did, the importance of the bowl. And you see it in the pictures. It's everywhere. We never parted from our bowls. When soup was served, no one wanted to go first, and no one wanted to go last. The first people in line got only water because the cook didn't feel like stirring the soup. Those in the middle at least got some beets. Nobody wanted to be at the end of the line because the dirt from the beets settled to the bottom of the kettle. Our water was so contaminated it was unfit to drink. So we waited for the rain or snow in order to catch something drinkable or even to wash with. At night, our bowl became a pillow and a toilet. Usually, there was no time to clean it in the morning before the so-called coffee was served. Then it became our wash basin. It was with us at all times, day and night. So the importance of possessing a bowl can't possibly be exaggerated. Whoever lost his bowl basically lost his life. Bowls were precious. One of my first jobs at the camp was taking corpses to the crematorium. We tossed the corpses onto a pile because the crematorium could not burn them fast enough. One day, I looked at the corpse I was supposed to heave onto the pile and I saw that it was Marianne Kaidash, my boyhood friend from school. I took the body of Kaidash myself, carried him straight to the furnace and gave him directly to those who were burning the bodies. I felt as if, through this gesture, I paid some homage to him and made his death a bit more dignified. Later, for three full days, in spite of my hunger, I was unable to swallow anything. I practically don't talk about the Holocaust. It is such a tremendous tragedy of the Jewish nation that I would never say in words how huge a tragedy it was. I'd prefer to remain silent. But I keep thinking how horrible it must have been to be unaware that you were going to your death. They went there thinking they were going to take a shower. Instead, the Nazis poured in gas. Some died instantly, some after 15 minutes.
Many hands grabbed their share of the bread ration as it was distributed. From the kitchen couple and company, the barrack boss with his coat, the room supervisor and his pals, it was only at the end that we, the prisoners, got the remnants. And with our primitive scales made out of a stick, we weighed the remaining pieces. Then we divided up those crumbs so that everyone received an equal share. That was our internal justice. People who are in extreme situations have a more acute sense of justice, different from the one that applies when you are free. One day, a board officer ordered us to climb a tree. And as we climbed, we had to shout over and over the correct way of reporting. Number 442, Along with dozens of shrieking companions, I clambered as high as I could to get away from the frantic, snarling dogs below us. Behind me, the cracking of breaking branches the wild howling of the realizations, the laughter of the amused soldiers and couples, the wailing of those who were falling. I managed to get up high, and suddenly, beyond the wire and the wall, I saw people going about their business, and I saw colorful little farmsteads which reminded me of my own families. This view was something unimaginably beautiful, which made the descent even more terrible. It was the tree of life and death. This experience and the memory of it, I saved for years to come. The only true man in the camp was Father Maximilian Kolbe. We may talk about his religion, but it doesn't matter here. He proved to be a man, and that's the only thing that really counts. When an inmate escaped from the camp, the Nazis selected 10 men to be put to death. One day, when this happened, one of the selected men begged the officer to spare his life and shouted that he had a wife and children. Father Colbert stepped forward and reported that he was ready to take the inmates' place. They shut the ten of them in the starvation cell, with no food or water. It was said that Colbert prayed with the men, encouraged them, and heard their confessions. After three weeks, the Nazis got impatient and entered the cell to find that four of them were still alive, including Father Colbert. Several days later, only for the Kolbe remained. An SS man finished him off with an injection of carbolic acid. This fact profoundly influenced my life in the camp, just as it must have influenced many of my fellow inmates. 
This man decided to give up his life in exchange for the life of a man he didn't even know. None of us would have ever been able to do something like that. I always joke that Father Kolbe somehow keeps me alive. From somewhere above, he keeps saying, there's one more thing you need to do. I am afraid that when this conversation comes to an end, when he has no more questions for me, and I have no more for him, that will mean that my life will come to an end as well. But I can see that he still needs me now. I still need to draw. My work is not complete yet. While drawing, I returned to the experiences of a teenage boy, growing up among thousands of men, placed in extreme situations, in a world in which anything could happen. I remember a violinist, an old Jew, who tried to give me a shovel, begging that I finish him off with it. That's the way it was. I came into the camp completely inexperienced, with Boy Scout ideals and my patriotic upbringing. I tried to protect myself somehow. I did what I could. I certainly do not want to be wiser in my drawing than I was then. I try to return to my youthful naivete. Now, as an old man, I write a letter to myself from years ago. In my drawings, I try to put in order and preserve only what survived with me, only what I managed to save, and what is now in me. In one of my drawings, I juxtapose myself as I was 55 years ago, and myself as I am now. The real life portrait is the one from now, but the face from the camp is a mask. In the camp, life was pretense hiding oneself behind something. In the picture, I uncover myself. In it, I place what for me is the most tragic thing, an alarm clock, which I dug out from the ruins of the crematorium. It is time held still for five and a half years, but will it have any meaning for anyone besides myself?
The inmates in the camp orchestra were of the opinion, and not unjustifiably so, that their work was something uplifting, which was like a respite for the other inmates, and gave them hope by listening to the music. But for most of us, the orchestra was like death. If we were unable to march to the beat, which was sometimes difficult or impossible, especially after the return from work, we would be beaten with rifle butts. So, in that case, we did not listen to the melody, but only tried to march to the beat, fully aware that in five minutes we could be dead. There were concerts for the SS officers, which were an entirely different matter. Sometimes I was able to get close enough to listen, and those were truly beautiful melodies, the pieces by Mozart and Strauss. My eyes would sometimes spill with tears. But in general, the role of the orchestra was terrible for the inmates, no matter how one looks at it. The scale at the end of this exhibit is of paramount importance to me. It appears here many times. It appears with the bread. It is everywhere. Because I would like everybody, before making a decision or actually doing something, to weigh it carefully and act only after thinking things over. We can never be sure how we might harm other people by our deeds. So, Mind the scales.
before you plunge into everyday life. Stop for a moment and listen one more time to what I, number 432, am saying to you. I would like to thank you wholeheartedly for our joint experiencing of Auschwitz. Your very presence here, your individual experience of my snapshots of memory, and your walk through my labyrinth is an homage paid to my departed fellow inmates burnt to ashes. But they have remained with me forever. My drawings that you have seen have been tattooed on my skin like the number 432. These are my deeply carved in wounds, publicly flogged with unimaginable cruelty, bleeding profusely. I crawled in the streets of the camps, carrying my concrete crosses to my Golgotha. This is my cry of pain and protest. This is my nakedness and shame, and my futile sermons of laboriously drawn lines. These are my rock engravings, my cave drawings, made for those to come in the future as evidence of bestiality in the 20th century, but also an attempt to save one's humanity. André Malraux once wrote, the dialogue between men and torture is deeper than the one between man and death. The Holocaust, the extinction of millions, the enormousness of the tragedy, the selections to the gas chambers, the daily dying in the pigsty of the camp, in constant hunger, in dirt, in degradation, urged on with curses to work faster and harder, in despair and hopelessness. Now, just like then, I carve on my wall, my death cell, those questions. Help me. What you wanted to see exists only? No, not only. In Auschwitz.